What's up? What's up? Welcome back, everyone. I see the chat room filling up already. Fantastic. Billy Carson here. Of course, I got to do the, do the, the, you know, the salute for a knowledge. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Tonight, we're going to go in on part two of the origins of religion. And I'm going to kind of go into the next area that I was kind of really alluding to last week. Um, but, uh, you know, an hour is a very short period of time. I mean, some of these topics you can talk about for 15, 20, 30 hours, obviously, because there's so much information and so much content and so many questions. And so it's, it's something that could last for a long time. I see everybody filling up the chat here, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Florida. I see you guys here from all over Seattle. Wow. Amazing. Maryland. All right. I appreciate every single one of y'all. Thank you for coming in and tuning in tonight. If you can, please click the like button on this video to help me get better engagement. And also, um, if you can, if you can share this video, that would be fantastic. <clears throat> Let me make sure the audio is doing good here. And uh, New York, Kentucky, Bronx, New York, the Boogie Down Bronx, Northwest Arkansas, South Carolina. Wow. Palestine. Wow. Palestine in the house. Free Palestine. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Oklahoma City, Reggie from Washington. All right, man. Listen, I appreciate y'all. Michigan in the house. A lot of great uh, people here. Cleveland, 216. What's up, Mad Dog? All right. We got a full house tonight. Thank you, Jeff Schultz, for the, uh, for the uh, donation. I missed it there. We got Philly in the house. We have... As you guys know, all the donations go to help underprivileged children, uh, single parents. We just gave away so much stuff for Christmas uh, over the holiday season. I think it was 580 gifts that were wrapped and sent out. Um, we did, uh, uh, I mean, we did the book drive for the um, for the inmates. Uh, out of my pocket alone, that was almost $1,800 in shipping fees because I paid for all the shipping on all the books that you guys sent to send out to the inmates. We only had about 11 books come back that weren't deliverable so far. So we're looking for a workaround. <coughs> we're looking for, sorry about that cough. We're looking for a workaround for the uh, undeliverables. But it was a great, great push. And a lot of people, almost 200 inmates got books. And we still have some more books that came in late past the time that we shipped them out. So we're going to do another book drive with those other books. Some will go to children and some will go to inmates. We'll figure out how we're going to mix that up. We probably have another, <clears throat> I don't know, another probably 200 books showed up after we shipped out all those books, which is great because now we have something that we can do. Uh, we can use those books for, all right? So that's going to be phenomenal. <clears throat> all right. So last week we talked about uh, religion, the origins of religion, and I touched on a lot of different topics and some theories as well. I talked about the cargo cults. If you haven't seen that video, you need to go back and watch it. I talked about the cargo cults, <clears throat> how when a more advanced civilization meets a less advanced civilization, the lesser advanced civilization deifies that more advanced civilization automatically. They just they just automatically assume that they're gods. All right. That's, that's kind of how it really works. Um, and it's been like that for millennia for eons this is not nothing no, it's nothing new it's typically what happens in any society <clears throat> and i mean any society during any era if you look back at history you'll find that this has happened literally dozens and dozens of times and even in this era that we are in now you would think that oh we're so technologically advanced and we've got all this knowledge and wisdom and blah 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 and we wouldn't be fooled but there are people on this planet, you got to remember 85% of the world is very religious. And so there's people on this planet that would still fall for it. If another advanced civilization came and visited us today, right now, they would automatically deify them. Or let's say one person only showed up, right? That person would be deified instantaneously <clears throat> because it would appear that they had superpowers when in actuality, it was probably metaphysical technology. In other words, a combination of spiritual and uh, and actual tech that you can combine together. And we are now experimenting with those same exact technologies in laboratories all around the world. OK, 
So today, we're, we, we last week we talked about some of the, um, you know, you heard me talk about the Enuma Elish. You heard me talk about the Atra Hasis many times. You, talk, you heard me say the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita and, and some of these texts, um, you know, but let me, let me show you what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> First of all, if I'm talking about something, that means I actually have it. That means I've actually gone through and read it, right? I'm not one of these people that has all this information to talk off the top of the head without actually being able to back it up. <clears throat> so let's look at, okay, we have here, what's this? The Enuma Elish. This is the Enuma Elish. This is the this is the seven tablets of creation right here. Now, obviously, it's written originally in Sumerian cuneiform. And now it's been converted into many different languages. And you can actually get this and you can actually read it for yourself. So you don't have to rely on he say, she say. You don't have to rely on a YouTube video. You can actually go and read it for yourself and get your own discernment out of it, right? <clears throat> I remember when I first came over across the Enuma Elish, I was studying cuneiform, you know, the ability to read Sumerian tablets. It's all in here. These are my books. This is just one of four cuneiform books that I actually have. I'm actually going to do a video where I take some wet clay and a stylus, which is what they call the thing that you use to actually press into the clay. And I'm going to write some words into wet clay. Not today. I'll do that probably on the next one. And I'll show you how to write in cuneiform. Okay. No, Zachariah Sitchin isn't the only person that knew about cuneiform, okay? There's literally thousands of people that known about it, and uh, and many people before Zachariah Sitchin was even born had already translated the tablets. Zachariah Sitchin is a great man. He didn't translate any tablets. That's a big lie that was going on to make him look like he was hoarding some kind of secret information. No, he wasn't hoarding any secret information. The guy took existing translations and wrote books about them. And he was brilliant for doing that because he gave us a glimpse or an idea into what might have happened in the ancient past. And he sparked a lot of researchers, and I'm one of them as well. But anybody can learn cuneiform. It's not some kind of hidden thing that you can't learn, and, and you've got to be some kind of uh, incredible scholar. It just takes application of time and will and patience. Okay, You heard me mention the Atra Hasis. Here's the ep epic of Atra Hasis, or the Atra Hasis. And the Atra Hasis epic, uh, I should say, depending on how you want to say it, sometimes it's epic first and then Atra Hasis or, or, or reversed. But again, this tablet is extremely similar to this tablet, both in cuneiform and both written in two different eras, but still thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, thousands. As a matter of fact, both of these texts right here, which make up the majority of the Old Testament, were written. Um, these are copied. In other words, the stones were copied, stones were copied again, and the stones were copied again, and the stones were copied again. These potentially, these stories potentially go back maybe even 40, 50,000 years. And what the, uh, what people would do is they would take a tablet and they would copy it onto a new stone and a new stone and a new stone to keep, to make, you know, like you're, like you're creating a, a published book. They would make copies. OK, and sometimes in future copies, some texts would get edited and changed. Some pieces that were missing would leave it up to the copiers, uh, um, I guess, their understanding or the way that they perceive what the text, the missing pieces are. Because as you can see, there's always little tiny pieces that chip away. Right. <clears throat> Pretty interesting stuff. So um, but it's interesting that the majority of the copies and we know there have been uh, are extremely similar. There's not, they're not that far off, right? Some of the missing areas are left up to interpretation uh, of the different people that have made the copies, but that's actually kind of normal with the human race. That's kind of what always happens with information, right? Um, you've heard me mention the Bhagavad Gita. There it goes, right? The Bhagavad Gita. And so the Bhagavad Gita is very interesting because it also is, some of this is actually in the... Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, all right? The book of Deuteronomy, some of this information from the Bhagavad Gita made it into there. Again, some more Old Testament uh, stuff. Um, then we have the Tibetan Book of the Dead, right? The Tibetan Book of the Dead. You probably didn't even know this book existed. This is a super ancient text. 
And a lot of this has made it into uh, Proverbs, made it into the Old Testament. Um, this is incredible stuff right here. It's a great, great book. You got to check it out. This one here, man, I had to go through this, you know, a few times. The Tibetan Book of the Dead. I also have another book here, which I didn't get a chance to bring over to this, uh, my desk tonight, but it's the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And it's actually the Egyptian Book of Going Forth by Day, which is the real name of the text. <clears throat> and in my version, I have the Papyrus of Ani. And a lot of that information, including the information that made it into the um, uh, into Moses's tablets, which were the first airdrop tablets, <laughs> right? <laughs> they came from the cloud. Uh, uh, those uh, Ten Commandments, they actually come from the Egyptian Book of the Dead and a lot of other texts in there, as well as a lot of Proverbs came from that book as well. But I have that in my other room. I don't want to walk away from the camera right now. Um, and then we have the Code of Hammurabi. Okay, the Code of Hammurabi. More Babylonian texts that make up some parts of the Old Testament as well. Okay, the Code of Hammurabi. I'm showing you these things because it's not, I don't want you guys listening to what I got to say and going, man, you know, this guy knows everything. We should just listen to him and don't do any research. No. I'm showing you these for you for a reason, so you can do some, uh, some of your own research. Here goes another book, Learn to Read Ancient Sumerian. Okay, this is actually my favorite one here. This really breaks it down in an easy way, and you can actually duplicate this pretty easily right off the bat and start learning how to read Sumerian and cuneiform tablets on your own, right? It just takes application, time, and patience. Okay, application, time, and patience. <clears throat> so you don't have to rely on other people's translations. You can come up with your own concept, your own idea of what the information is saying, right? <clears throat> All right. You know, I've taught in the Egyptian mystery schools and I taught hieroglyphs, Egyptian hieroglyphs. And here goes uh, one of the simplest books to start with for how to read, how to learn how to read Egyptian hieroglyphs, the language of light. Right. That's what hieroglyphs are. The Egyptian hieroglyphs are literally the language of light. So you want to definitely get into that. <clears throat> and you've heard me talk about the Mahabharata a lot. Well, here it goes, guys. It's heavy. Here's the Mahabharata. It's a 10 volume set. Okay. It's a 10 volume set. And the information in here is absolutely incredible. It reads like a Star Wars movie. It literally reads like a Star Wars movie. Um, and so, you know. <laughs> You have to get these texts if you want to get to the next level and you want to learn and you want to be able to regurgitate the information that I'm putting out. Um, I'm giving you the sources, right? I'm giving you the sources of the information. A lot of people have heard about Enoch. As a matter of fact, he's revered in the biblical text, but his book, his actual book was left out of the Bible. This is Enoch, the book of Enoch. I actually have a couple of versions of the Book of Enoch, just because some add a little bit more of a compendium to the to the information, right? So, and I have a third one somewhere up here. I got I don't know hundreds of books in this house, maybe a thousand plus. Some in the closet in cases that I haven't even put packed up yet, unpacked yet. But the Book of Enoch is very interesting <laughs> because in the Book of Enoch. He's talking about beings that came down from the heavens. And these beings were flesh and blood people. And not only were they flesh and blood people, but they interacted with humans and they taught us how to make weapons of war to attack one another. Not only did they teach us how to make weapons of war, they went to war with us. They went to battle. They had to put on protection. Now, what type of angel do you know that has to put on protection against getting cut? So these were people, flesh and blood people like me and you just a little bit more advanced technologically from another place, but still our cousins in a way, because we look like them and they look us. They were distinguishable by the shapes of their heads. Uh, that's what really distinguished them according to some of these texts. But the book of Enoch was admitted and not put into the canonized Bible because he's talking about aliens interacting with people, period, point blank. There's no way to get around it. As a matter of fact, Enoch had an appointed time with these beings 
where he would be taken into space. And he uh, it was an appointed time. He wasn't abducted. He wasn't stolen away. And he wasn't such a good uh, person and uh, worshiper that he was whisked away. It was an appointed time. And he even gave his records of his business and everything to his sons to hold. When the day came, he was taken into uh, into the vehicle and taken up into space. He even describes the earth shape, shape and color as he's taken up into space. Uh, and then he's brought back at a later time. So he wasn't taken away permanently and forever. He did come back. All right. So pretty interesting stuff. So what we see here uh, and the reason why I'm you know, talking this stuff is because we have to understand that there are two different things operating uh, in terms of belief systems on the planet. One belief system is based off of religion, and people tend to get religion confused with spirituality. That's why I'm doing an entire workshop in December, December 11th. It's free. It doesn't cost you any money. You can register on Eventbrite. As a matter of fact, I'll get the link and drop it in this chat. It's a free workshop I'm doing. It's called Religion versus Spirituality. And the purpose is not to bash religion, but it's to awaken you to the understanding that a lot of the stuff that you're reading in a lot of the what I call modern religious texts is actually copied information. And it's actually just plagiarized information in a way that's set up to control the masses. True spirituality, you can directly connect with the creator without having to go through a group of middlemen or middle people. You don't have to go to the temple in a physical building because the temples are right here. This is your temple. Your body is the temple. Uh, and so the true, um, the true wisdom of ascension and ascension knowledge is learning how to quantum entangle with the universal consciousness. Some call it God, whatever nature, whatever you want to call it. That is the true ultimate goal. Uh, uh, you know, or that you should be your true ultimate goal for ascension. The other systems that have been put in place direct you through man and through man, everything is corrupted. Like Tupac said, everything is corrupted once a man touch it. A lot of the text has been altered. A lot of the text has been um, uh, permanently, uh, purposely, purposefully left out. The entire Apocrypha uh, has been left out, which I have the Apocrypha. I think it's upstairs. Those are books of the Bible that should be in there, but were left out by the Council of Nicaea because they were deemed too um, hot, okay, too steamy, too crazy. Uh, they talk, a lot of them talk about um, human beings being uh, extremely wise in the very beginning. Uh, for example, you have the, um, the, the myth of Adapa, which talks about the fact that Ea Enki says that, tells Adapa, who's Adam, tells him that um, he is was created even wiser than the Anunnaki, that there's a hidden code inside of us. And in that hidden code, once we tap into it, we become wiser, we become better, we can even advance past and beyond where these Anunnaki beings uh, were. And for that, Enlil, his brother, was completely enraged when he found out what was, what was going on, what, what Enki had done. He was completely enraged. And it really pissed them off, you know. So um, you have to understand that there's a lot of these texts are a lot of the information that made it into this book right here come from <laughs> ancient text. OK, even in some people say, well, well, what about the New Testament? Well, even in the New Testament, there are places in my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablet, where I distinctly go through and make the comparisons between the old testament and also you know the new testament and and then it really breaks it down in a way where you can see everywhere where jesus is actually speaking his words actually come from the emerald tablets of thoth which are thirty six thousand years old so which came first the chicken or the egg now why would there be that similarity in information and context why would his teachings be extremely similar to the teachings of thoth the atlantean priest king who ruled over the land of Kem for 14,000 years, around 56,000 BC. Why would that be? Okay. Well, the reason why that would be is simply because if you have the gospel of the Holy 12, which is also missing from the Bible, if you have the gospel of the Holy 12, 
you discover that when Jesus was 12 years old, he disappears from the Bible and he he uh, he's in this text. And where he goes is he goes to Egypt. He goes to Egypt for what? To study the Egyptian mysteries. Who invented the first Egyptian mystery school? Who or it really was called the Kemetic Mysteries? Who developed that? They were developed by Thoth the Atlantean priest king. So where did Jesus go? Really, his name was not Jesus. His name was Yeshua. Je Jesus is actually not a real name. But where did Yeshua go? Yeshua went to the land of Chem to learn, and he became an adept initiate to learn the Egyptian mysteries or the Kemetic mysteries. And in there, he learned all of the teachings that are in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and beyond. So when he's speaking in the New Testament, the reason why a lot of his, the, what he's saying is matching the Emerald Tablets is because that's where it came from. Just like if I go to uh, I go to school, right? I went to I took a course at MIT in applied neuroscience, and in that course they talk about how um, you know the human body emits this uh, magnetic field from the heart, and this magnetic field wraps around the body like a torus. So this is what they teach at MIT. This is not just a spiritual postal meme on social media. And if somebody is nervous, frustrated, scared, uh, anxiety, and their cortisol is level raised, their cortisol actually comes out of through their skin and, and wraps around through that magnetic field that's wrapping around their body. And anybody who interacts with that magnetic field can pick up those, those heightened cortisol levels and it can raise their cortisol levels and their stress levels. So just like I told you that, how did I say that exact thing? How did I copy? How did I, where did I come up with that? Well, I learned that when I went to class at MIT, right? Just like when Yeshua went to class at the mystery schools. That's why what he's saying here is extremely similar to what's being said in the biblical, uh, in, in the Emerald Tablets. What he's saying in, in the Bible is extremely similar to what's being said in the Emerald Tablets. You know, so I covered that. There's a, quite a few verses in here that I go side by side that you can read in my book where I show you the biblical verse. And then I show you where Jesus is speaking or Yeshua. Then I show you the Emerald Tablets verse and you go, oh, this is saying the same thing. But again, which came first, the chicken or the egg? One text is tens of thousands of years older than the other. And so what he's doing is he's, um, you know, the people who wrote the Bible were the Phoenicians. Who were the Phoenicians? The Phoenicians were followers of who? This guy. The people that wrote the text on the parchment papers and the cylinder scrolls and all that stuff that make up the Bible, because the Bible wasn't written like from, I mean, just write a Bible from page one to page whatever. People were copying tablets and turning them into um, writing them on paper and, 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 and um, different types of parchments and storing them in vases and studying them in caves and so forth, right? And so basically, people over the years had uncovered some of these things in these different caves and locations around the Middle East and began to put them together and create this, what we call a Bible. The Bible wasn't written by somebody standing there side right next to somebody who was supposedly speaking and writing on everything that was going on. In other words, the Bible was not written in real time. Matter of fact, the disciples, they were actually illiterate men. They couldn't even read or write. OK, they couldn't even read or write. So that answers a lot of questions for you there. The Bible was written thousands of years after these people died. Matter of fact, it wasn't starting to be put together until 100 A.D. to 900 A.D. That's the time frame that the biblical text was extracted, discovered from caves and so forth and cultivated into what we call the canonized Bible. OK. This is handpicked, curated information, just like, you know, um, I'm a music artist, right? And so I, su I submit my music to a lot of um, uh, streaming services. One streaming service in particular is Pandora. Now, Pandora is not like Spotify or Apple Music or Deezer or Tidal. Pandora actually curate all the music that they accept into their platform. So if you submit to Pandora, for your submit your music to Pandora, it may or may not get accepted. They hand pick what they want. They actually have a physical, a human being that actually listens to your music <laughs> and actually and actually puts it in there. Okay. Um, 
you know, so this is incredible. So this is the same system that the Bible is written in. Okay. Now, uh, what's interesting is this Bible has good information in it. There's good information in that book. There's actually great information in the book. You have to know how to discern what's good and what's actually not good. There's things in there that will make you think it's okay to commit specific types of crimes against other people because it's being ordered by God when you in reality it's not God. See, until you get some of these texts that I've got here and these books and, and learn how to read uh, cuneiform and learn how to I, my Aramaic book is upstairs, convert some of this text backwards into Aramaic and start reading that, you start finding out what areas are actually not being um, prudent for mankind to follow. So just like in anything, um, you have to have discernment, right? I can take this book and I can pan pick verses. I can curate information out of this book. I can hand pick verses that if you listen to them, if you read them, if you study them, and if you actually act on them, you can actually get a good result. Okay. That's why I read everything. That's why I study. I'm a student of everything. <clears throat> now there's information in here. That's not so good. Like in the book of Deuteronomy, it okays things like rape. It okays uh, things like abduction, right? False imprisonment. <clears throat> All those things are in there. Why? Because God is commanding people to actually do these things to other people. But it's not actually the creator of the universe that's speaking in the book of Deuteronomy. When you translate the book of Deuteronomy uh, into its original text, you find out that it's gods with an S, plural, and those gods end up not being gods at all. They end up being flesh and blood people. That's why you have to learn Sumerian. They come out of Sumeria, and they're called the Anunnaki, or in the Bible, they're called the Anak. In our eyes, we were grasshoppers in their sight. That's what it says in the Bible. These people were huge people as well. <clears throat> but they were very intelligent and technologically advanced people. They took, they ruled over humans in certain regions of the planet, and they had humans fighting each other because uh, just like we do today, they would send a, a person. You, you'll go to college and you'll say, you, I mean, you go to school, high school, and you'd be like, I want to go to college, but I can't afford college. And so what will you do? You say, well, if I join the military, as I saw a TV commercial, they're going to give me money. They're going to give me money to, to, to pay for college or they're going to pay for my college. So you join up with them, and then somebody in a $10,000 suit sends you halfway around the world with a $5 million weapon to blow up a guy on a camel with a $5 tent. And in your mind, you reconcile that as, I'm not a bad person. I'm just following orders, all right? And in return, I'm going to get this college education. So if you take this back into the ancient times in the book of Deuteronomy, for example, where you see all these wars happening, where you have the quote unquote God talking and telling people to go to this city and kill the women, kill the children. It even says rape the women. That's the exact terminology. It's right here in the Bible. Look it up. Rape the women. You can actually take the virgins if you want. That's abduction, right? Uh, you can, you know, false imprisonment. You can take the, you can take the, uh, the virgins uh, and all that kind of good stuff. You can take the spoils, but bring the spoils back to me. This is a war going on against people that had masqueraded as gods and used human beings as chattel to fight their battles, just like they do today. A guy in a $10,000 suit sends a kid halfway around the world to kill somebody so we can steal oil. The same thing happens right now. Uh, the same thing was happening back then. They send you halfway around the world to go infiltrate a, infiltrate a city and kill all the people and bring the spoils of war. Where now that god, lowercase g, owns that property, owns that castle or that land. And now has control and rulership over it and just gaining more control. There were these battles of the gods back in the day. These battles are in the Mahabharata, which I just showed you. The battles are in the Bhagavad Gita, which I just showed you. The battles are in the biblical text in the book of Deuteronomy. The battles persist all throughout all the texts that I have. The book of Enoch, they teach you how to make weapons so we can go to war. I mean, I can just keep going on and on and on. And so what's interesting is this creates this warring mentality in mankind this is one of the biggest problems that i have with believing in religion and not following the spiritual path in religion you become a zealot and a zealot is extremely dangerous okay 
a zealot is extremely, extremely dangerous. Why? Because a zealot will do anything for the entity that they are worshiping or the subject or topic that they're worshiping. They will do anything that they believe is needed, including injure, hurt, or kill somebody. What you find when you look at the when you look at ancient history and you look at the wars on this planet, you discover that the majority of the wars that happened on this planet were for religious reasons. In other words, more people have died due to religion than any other reason on the face of the earth. Again, like I talked about last week, the papal inquisitions. In order to bring Catholicism around the world, the popes for 700 years killed over 50 million people on this planet, killed and tortured. And if you don't believe this, just go to the museums. They actually have the museums. They're so proud of what they did. They have museums that show these death tools. Okay. They have the Pope's spear. You know what that was? If you were a woman and you didn't want to worship their Lord and Savior the way that they wanted you to, if you didn't believe in that or you were an indigenous person, right? Because they conquered these different cultures. What they would do is they take you, the chiefess of the town, of the, of the tribe, and string her up and put this Pope's spear inside of your private part. The Pope's spear would then expand like this and pop on the inside and blow up the woman's private part. Uh, and then, of course, she would just bleed to death. What a horrible way to die. Then they had this other thing which looked like a pyramid with a spire on top, a very sharp needle-looking spire on top, right? And that spire, well, what they would do is they would actually take a man. Let's say they came to your town, right, your tribe, and they you you guys weren't following, falling in line. Well, let me take the chief, and I'm going to tie him up to this tree, and I'm going to raise him up, and I'm going to drop him through the anus onto the spire, onto this very sharp stick coming out of this pyramid looking thing they have this inside the museum and they would raise you and drop you raise you and drop you raise you and drop you while your entire tribe or your entire town watched this and what was the purpose of that the purpose was to force you into saying okay we're going to fall in line and, and we're going to worship this thing because if we don't we're going to end up doing we're going to end up tortured like this and by that method over the course of 700 years they tortured and killed over 50 million people this is actual history. That made Hitler look like an angel. I mean, think about the think about the comparison here. I mean, he killed six million. These people killed fifty million. So when you hear people saying that the good news was spread around the world, Christianity was spread around the world by uh, by love and everything else. No, every country, every indigenous continent was invaded. The women and the men were murdered, killed, and raped, and beaten into submission in order to take on this religious belief system. That's how it happened. If you look at the Arabs, the Arabs, right? You look at um, their their Muslim belief. That was also uh, put out there and how they got dominant with it was to go and murder and kill. If you go to Egypt, whoever goes to Egypt with me this uh, October, right? This year, October this year, I think we're almost sold out. You better hurry up if you wanna get a seat. We're only taking really 40 people. If when uh, when we go to Egypt, we go to Coptic Cairo. Coptic Cairo is one of the oldest areas uh, of Christianity, Christianity that, that existed before the birth of Jesus. And in Coptic Cairo, the house where Jesus actually lived is still there. Yeshua, I actually was in that house now twice. I've been there. It's a shrine. He actually lived there while he attended the Egyptian mystery schools. <clears throat> and so uh, you find there the history of the the slaughter of the arabs you see the people in egypt they never spoke arabic they never spoke arabic that's not their language just like mexicans don't speak spanish those people ain't spanish they're not they're not latinos those people are mayans and, and aztecs and, and so forth and so uh what happened was the arabs came there and they slaughtered and murdered so many people and forced them into speaking arabic which they still speak till this very day they banished them from learning their own egyptian hieroglyphs so after generation after generation by the second generation they didn't even know how to read hieroglyphs anymore they just started teaching hieroglyphs four years ago in egypt again in school they just started. they had to rely on germany and japan and and other archaeologists from other countries to learn how to teach them how to learn and read their own hieroglyphs. 
Uh, so it's pretty interesting. So again, that's another religious cult that had dominated the world at one time uh, and, and still is running, up and running. And when you look at the history of, like I talk, talked about last week, where their belief system comes from, it comes from aliens. It comes from aliens, right? This alien descends down and talks to this guy and tells him, hey, write this down. This guy can't read or write, so he has to hire another guy to come scribe what he's being told. And they turn that whole thing into a religion. Meanwhile, it suppresses women. It oppre oppresses women. It's got things in it that, that um, if you don't obey it as a woman, you can be stoned to death and killed, just like in the Old Testament. Um, and something that resonates with those two religions is the fact that the female energy, the female frequency has been completely suppressed, which is another big problem. So you have the suppression of the feminine energy. And this is why when you go to Egypt and when you go with me, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It looks like a giant bachelor pad. The whole Middle East looks like a giant bachelor pad. Why? There's no feminine energy in there. No feminine energy. Everything is brown. There's no colors. There's no different alternating colors. There's no flowers and plants. Everything is brown. Everything is dirty. Garbage in the streets. All right. And why is that? Because women have no say so in anything. It's it's a it's like a giant bachelor pad. And so it's missing the feminine energy. And uh, it's evident. Now, you take that same concept and apply it to anything in life where the feminine energy has been completely wiped out or taken away, especially in religious contexts where women couldn't even walk into a synagogue. They couldn't walk into a temple. They couldn't walk into a church. That just started happening in modern times. That's just started happening. So it really surprises me these days when there's women out here that are, you know, calling God a him and a he because they don't even understand that that, again, is that male dominance thing again it's the male energy dominance god is not a man there is no man that's a god god is not a man god is a frequency just like everything in this entire universe is a frequency if you go into quantum physics and quantum mechanics you discover that everything in that, that exists in this entire universe is actually waves of potential and those waves of potential exist as waves of light Light that we can't see with the human naked eye because we only see 1% of the light spectrum, right? We only see 1% of the light spectrum. We can't see gamma rays. We can't see x-rays. We can't see ultraviolet. We can't see the multi-spectrum, you know? We can't see any, any of that stuff. <clears throat> but what we can see is only the colors of the rainbow, and that's it. That's all we get. Pretty much RGB is the maximum that we can really focus on. But we know that other colors exist because we have computers and technology and cameras that can pick up these other frequencies of light and waves of light. And they discover that every single atom exists as a wave of light before it collapses into something that we consider to be solid. Right. And what's happened is in the universe itself as a whole, there's a balance. There's a yin and a yang. Right. And in a system that we've now created on Earth with religion. We've only got the yin, no yang. There's no balance there. So in a lot of the religions, the reason why they're so detrimental, when they actually, some of them could be prosperous and actually help people, the reason why over time you see that they actually have been very bloody and unsuccessful is because of the removal, the complete removal of feminine energy to the point where, they, where even women think that God is a man. And so that concept and that twist in the brain that has been handed down from generation to generation has altered a way that we even perceive the creator of the universe. Right. And we've gotten so cocky with it that we even perceive that the creator of the universe is actually in here with us, hanging out and wanting us to win basketball games and wanting us to win wars and, and all this kind of crazy stuff. There is no creator of the universe that is hanging out, hanging around, waiting for you to pray if you can win a football game. There is no creator of the universe hanging around waiting for you to pray if you can win this war and you can you can kill these people over here and come home safely. It doesn't exist. I'm sorry. It just doesn't exist. Right. What you can do is if you're a competitor, you can pray that you can perform at your highest level. Right. But you think that there's somebody out there with a magic wand waving it saying, oh, this team deserves to win today. And then when they win, oh, yeah, God was good to us. No, no. You just had talent. You you. You followed the game plan and you actually won the game because you, you worked hard and you practiced and you trained 
and you made the right decisions in the game and you won. All right. That's how it works out. There's a verse in the Bible where Jesus is standing outside talking to a, a small multitude of people and his disciples are there. And there are some buildings off in the distance that are really old buildings. Uh, the tops of them are really dilapidated and it's a very windy day. And two or three women were walking by the building when the wind blew. And when the wind blew, those stones from the top of that dilapidated structure fell and crushed them right there where they were walking. And right away, the disciples said, oh, they died for their sins. They were evil. And Jesus said in so many words, no, man, <laughs> they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. You see? We take things out of context. We take things and we turn them into something that's really not there. And why we do that as people, I'm not quite sure. But there is one small answer that's possible. There was a study done uh, about maybe, I think it was now nine years ago, in a laboratory where biologists were accessing the human genome. And they discovered a gene that we have. It's called a worship gene. The interesting thing about this worship gene, two things actually. One thing is they discovered that it was inserted into the human genome about 200,000 years ago. <clears throat> now, why is that significant? Well, that's significant because, where's this book at? <laughs> According to the ancient Sumerian tablets, right? According to the Sumerian tablets, uh, about 200,000 years ago is when mankind was genetically modified and forced to do the labor of the gods. That's why it's ironic. And the, the, the biologists and the scientists said it's 200,000 years ago, but we can't figure out how, because in order for this mutation to occur, it would take millions and millions of years of evolution. It looks like this was purposefully done. Well, yeah, it was pur purposefully done. They then turn the gene off. They learn how to turn the gene on and turn the gene off. When they turn the gene off, the person is no longer to want to worship any outside source. They focus on self. They look. When they turn the gene on, the person seeks for exterior uh, gratification, exterior deity, exterior help. This is a gene, in my opinion, that was inserted at the time that telomere chromosome number two was cut out and fused together and the telomere caps were put on. That's in the Tower of Babel incident. At the same time, I believe that they also inserted the worship gene. And what better slave to have is a slave that doesn't know it's a slave. So when you go to Egypt, you find that the people that worked on these pyramids, because the pyramids were labored on by actual people. Now, the architectural guide and the floor plan came from higher above, came from the Atlantean priest king, for example, at the Great Pyramid. He was the master architect of that structure. The people did the work under his tutelage and his training and using his technology. However, what you find when you go there is they had, uh, they worked, they weren't slaves. There were no slaves building any pyramids in Egypt, not one. That information that talks about people being slaves in Egypt inside this book is actually false. When you go to Egypt directly, like I've been a few times, you find out that not only were they working uh, out of their own, uh, you know, want, want and need to appease the gods, but they were also getting paid and they even had health care. Yeah, health care thousands of years ago. They had health care. And so and when you go to Egypt with me, we'll, you're going to go to these locations. You're going to see the temples and the buildings and the structures where the workers would check in to go to work. They worked out of only one thing, to please the gods. Uh, they were paid very little. They were taken care of if they became injured. Um, but they didn't realize that they were slaves. When they had the days when you would have to give your, um, your, you know, your atonement and you would have to go make your sacrifice and bring in your you know, cut up your, you know, slice the throat of your of your calf and, and bring in your first harvest, right? All those things. You're going to find out when you come to Egypt with me what that was for. That was for these people to get food and eat. They have the temples there, which we're going to visit the temples. And in these temples, they have these storehouses where all these, when all these offerings would come, those offerings, because these people were not going to go out and hunt. They were not going to farm. They weren't going to go grow any crops. 
No, you bring me the food and the crops, and then I'm going to pretend to be your God, and I'm going to say, yeah, I bless you, and uh, and you go on about your business. All right? You're going to find this out when you go to Egypt with me. And so they would store all this food in these storehouses that they had, these locked containers that they would have in the back in some of these um, temples. And it was purely for the gods to eat. Now, when I say gods, I do mean lowercase g. These are the Anunnaki people. They were just for them to have food. And they weren't going to go kill no cows. They weren't going to grow no cattle and all this kind of stuff. You just got pimped. And we're still getting pimped today the same exact way. <clears throat> you got the worship gene. You want to worship something on the outside. Everybody's focusing on the outside, outside, outside. Nobody's focusing on the inside. That's where the big problem arises. When you're looking external for external salvation, I guarantee you, you will never find it. You will think you found it. You will convince yourself that you found external salvation, but in true reality, you only tricked yourself. The only way to, to receive a salvation is to go within. And you don't need any exterior source to, um, to, uh, to, to, to forgive you and all this kind of stuff. You can forgive yourself. Matter of fact, until you forgive yourself, you're never going to be forgiven. Until you forgive your, I don't care if you're, I don't care if you hurt somebody, you did something to somebody, and then you apologize to them and they say, I forgive you. You're still not, you're still not forgiven. Your, your conscience is still not fully satisfied until you actually look at your shadow face to face and say, man, I screwed this up bad. You know what? I apologize to them. I tried to make everything right. And now all I can do is move forward. And you know what? I forgive me. I forgive myself. I have to learn from this. What can I learn from this? How can I become a better person from this experience? What can I glean from this mistake that I made? And once you understand that, and once you accept that, and once you understand how to change from that, you've now rewritten your DNA. And you've just been born again. Yeah, that's it. There's no magic sky daddy out there coming down to to hit you with a wand and say, oh, all your sins are forgiven. Like I said last week, the biggest problem with this forgiven sin thing is it gives people a way to escape uh, taking, you know, taking full ownership of their screw ups. In other words, I can go out here and I can do something to somebody. I can blow somebody away and then I can just go home and say, oh, you know, please forgive me. And then the next thing you know, I'm good to go again. That's how that's how they think it works. You see, that there's a big problem with that. That's that's actually doesn't work. You're, you're fooling yourself. And so people use it as a crutch. Oh, I screwed up today. Oh, forgive, you know, please forgive me. And then, oh, I'm, I got a clean slate. That's what they tell you in church. Doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. Even if you read this book, the, <laughs> this book doesn't even say it works that way. The Bible doesn't even say it works that way. And so what you have to do is you have to understand that you need to Understand what you did. You need to face what you did. Try to make atonement for what you did. And then after you've done all of that, forgive yourself and move on. That's forgiveness. Being born again is when you rise to a higher level of consciousness. And you can look back on your previous level that you were at and go, wow, man, I came up here. I'm up here now. I moved up a notch. You were born again in a higher level of consciousness. Getting splashed in water and dumped in the ocean and all that stuff, waste of time, means nothing. Waste of time. Taking a brand new baby and splashing water all over them, waste of time, means nothing. Means absolutely nothing. Does nothing. It just gets you wet and then you need a towel. Being born again has to do with growing consciously. Every time you move up another notch, you're born again. And you'll be born again many times in the same lifetime. These are the secrets that the Anunnaki us and didn't want us to understand and know. They wanted us to go through them for everything so that we can continue to worship them and do the work for them. That's what it was all about. It's all about labor and slavery. And if you don't believe me, then you got to read the Atrahasis epic. This is where the information is. It's right in here, guys. It's right in here. Part of it made it into the Bible, but they accidentally on purpose left out the part where the EGG were getting ready to go to war against Enlil and Enki. This is when the gods fell from heaven to earth, right? And the Bible, it's the angels. They rebelled against God. 
these EGG people who are Anunnaki, they rebelled against Anu, who was known as the god of his of his pantheon. He had a, the original pantheon. And he um, they fell from heaven to earth. They came from Mars to earth. They came from Lamu to Ki. All right. Lamu is Mars. Ki is Earth. Why did they come here? They were on Mars doing a lot of labor. They were mining Mars for resources. They came here to go to battle against Enki and Enlil. Why did they rebel against Anu and his and his sons? Because according to the text, they were being forced to do labor as if they were slaves and they weren't supposed to be slaves. They were volunteers and they labored for a couple hundred thousand years. I think it was 250,000 years they labored without the use of any human uh, assistance whatsoever. <clears throat> And then they got to the point where they said, you know what? Our needs aren't being met. Our demands aren't being met. We're going to go to war. They came and they encircled the campus of Enki and Enlil in a place in Africa called Adam's Calendar. Adam's Calendar still exists today. Matter of fact, I was supposed to go there in 2020, but you know what happened there. <clears throat> I'll probably get there in 2023. I won't get there this summer. Uh, with Michael, Michael Tellinger has a museum right next to Adam's Calendar, and he's going to give me the tour of Adam's Calendar. Adam's calendar is important because it's the oldest known gold mine discovered on Earth in Africa. And the organic material at the mine shows that it dates back to 200,000 years, exactly at the time I said about the worship gene and exactly at the time that these people decided to go to war at Adam's calendar against Enki and Enlil and Anu. <clears throat> Interesting that it all merges together. All right. And then they took women after they came to an agreement first that they would genetically modify the existing hominid on the planet, adding their essence to it, which means, you know, some type of modification in some way and make it do the labor. Once that was agreed upon, they said, OK, we're getting out of here now. We're not going to go to war today. But what we are going to do is we're going to take some of these women. And that's when the sons of God, which was the EGG, because they were all under Anu, made it with the daughters of men. And they gave birth to the Nephilim. Okay. All this is in the text, guys. This is all in the text. The Enuma Elishan, the seven tabs of creation. The Atra Hasis epic. This is all in there. All this stuff is in there. The Sumerian tablets in the British Museum, the one where Isis gives birth to the Adamu. There were already a lot of people on the planet. Don't believe this thing about Adam and Eve were the first two people. And from Adam and Eve, you got this you got 8 billion people on the planet. That's garbage. <clears throat> in the Bible itself, if you take your time and you actually read the Bible right, you discover that humans were created twice in the beginning. There's two humans that are created in the beginning. When you read the Sumerian tablets, you discover the same thing. In the beginning, it elaborates a little bit more. They created people to do the work. They took some of the people that they genetically modified and cloned them, and those people weren't able to mate. And because they weren't able to successfully mate, they weren't able to duplicate, and cloning was a very tedious process. They didn't have the manpower for that. So they started getting frustrated, <clears throat> but it did have a lot of people on the planet. And so what they did was they then did another experiment. Isis said, you know what? I'm going to take one of the women, and I'm going to take her egg. I'm going to add our essence to it. That means some type of a genetic modification or adding maybe the sperm. Maybe it's a, in you know. Uh, artificial infertilization. She inserts it into her womb. This is in the Sumerian tablets. She then takes it to term 10 months, not nine months, but 10 months. It's very specific. In 10 months, she gives birth to the first Adamu, A-D-A-M-U, which means first man. There's a picture of her etched into a stone holding up the Adamu, saying, my hands have created him. Uh, and that's at the British Museum. This predates all the biblical texts by thousands of years. She put him in the Edin, E-D-I-N. And that was in Mesopotamia, which is now modern day Iraq. It was an outdoor uh, type of a enclosed uh, laboratory where they began to experiment with, with the Adamu, raising him up and then trying to get him to mate with, when he was of mating age with other uh, people. He was, It wasn't successful. So they actually took some blood from him, some samples from him. This is where we get the rib story. The tablets are very clear that they took blood from him. They took a sample from him and created a clone. 
which was Eve. And then when they made it, when he made it with Eve, they were able to uh, have a baby. This is all clear in the text, and it predates the biblical text by thousands of years. Now, to add more credence to the fact that there were people here, when Cain killed Abel and was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, um, which, by the way, Adam was also kicked out, and you can read the, the book of Adam, right, that's kept out of the Bible. It's pretty heartbreaking, that story. It's actually, it makes you, it'll choke you up. It's pretty heartbreaking. But um, when, you, when you analyze Cain and he says to and Lil, who's known as Yahweh in the Bible, he says, um, the people out there will kill me. Well, what people? <laughs> well, there was already people out there. He said, matter of fact, he said, I'm going to put a mark on you. They'll know you, my boy. And when you go out there, you're going to meet your wife. What wife? This is what began the whole clan of the Canaanites. Um, most of the Canaanites ended up in Mesoamerica. They ended up halfway around the world. All right, there's a whole other video I got to make about that and how they got there. But regardless, so you have the snake that came, comes into the garden. The snake is knowledge in, in, in Egypt, in, in Chem. It's knowledge and wisdom. What was the apple? The apple was knowledge, knowledge of self. Uh, so E.I. Enki, who actually loved humans, came in and was talking to them in the tablets about who they really were, how powerful they really were. A lot of that makes it into the myth of Adapa. So if you read the myth of Adapa, which I have on one of these, I couldn't sell them. I have so many books in here, but I have the myth of Adapa. That text, which was kept out of the Bible, is um, it talks about the fact that E.I. Enki was talking to them about how powerful they are, how knowledgeable they are, how, how incredible they could become. The true potential of mankind is far exceeding them, the, you know, him himself and the, and the Anunnaki. Um, and that was the knowledge that he gave them. That's why they put on clothes. They were like, man, we gods, man here running around like animals naked and that's when and lil came back and got pissed off that's in the bible known as yahweh right you know you call him god and he was like oh man my brother did this i'm gonna call him the devil and i'm gonna tell everybody don't worship, don't talk to him because he's evil when and lil was actually the evil one as a matter of fact when you read the tablets you find out that this guy and lil was killing people like you wouldn't believe he was killing humans like it was like if he would wake up and there was too much noise outside, he would order the guards to just go kill them off, kill off people. If they were getting too many people in the population, once they figured out the code on how to grow, how to make people mate, he would just uh, dry out their fields. He would spray pestilence on them, the original chemtrails. Where do you think they get the idea from for the chemtrails? They got it from the tablets and kill off people by the thousands. This is the kind of guy he was. He was, he was extremely evil, but he... He claimed that his brother was evil, but his brother wasn't the evil one. It was actually him. He was the one that was evil. And that's why I think that the Nag Hammadi got it right. The Nag Hammadi. These are the Nag Hammadi scriptures. When you read the Gnostic text in here, you, you realize that they got it right in a lot of ways. Not always, but in a lot of ways. Because what they realized was that this book right here is orchestrated by people Actually, the person that wrote the KJV, King James Version, he's a Satanist. So King James is actually a Satanist. Actually, his book, his Satanist book did better than this book. <laughs> so, but what, 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 the, what these people realized way before that guy was even born was that this book is orchestrated in a way, the information is orchestrated in a way that you're actually following the same evil that you're running from. And the true path to enlightenment and ascension is through spirituality, okay? Which I'm going to do that whole workshop on spirituality and religion. I'm going to go deep into a lot of information. And we're going to compare spiritual practices with religious practices. That's going to be in December. You can sign up for that workshop. I'll drop the link in here again, all right? Let me drop the link in this chat again for you. Sign up for free. Didn't cost you any money. And um, I'm going to go really deep into the two so you can see that the true path to enlightenment is through spirituality and metaphysics. And the, the path that was going to lead you to destruction is actually in this book. Like I said last week, if the devil is a, a super genius, right? Satan the devil is this IQ of 2,000. He's not even an angel. He's a cherubim. He can create things. He has everything that he can do everything that God can do uh, just about. 
All right. He was the right hand and everything, all this good stuff. And he can he's got he can whisper in the ears of millions of people. And he's got all this power. I said to that guy who was trying to convert me, I said, he said to me, I told him, I, I asked him, I said, do you think that that this Satan, the devil is going to follow every word in this book that was written and all and, and, and edited by a human being by to his own destruction? And he said, yeah, I said, no, no, no. Don't you think it's more likely that that same entity orchestrated this book in a way that would lead you to your destruction? That's what the Nag Hammadi believes. That's what the, the, the Gnostics believe. I'm sorry, the, the Gnostics. And I think they're right. I think that it's been flipped. I think that people are, that have been chasing after the devil this whole, entire time because the references of the Elohim and the uh, and Yahweh and so forth in the Bible are actually these Anunnaki people, not the creator of the universe. Not even close. These are flesh and blood people. Now, is there a creator of the universe? I actually believe that there is. I believe that there's a creator of the universe. Why? Quantum physics proves it. We're living in a creation. There's no way to get around that we're living in a creation. I believe that wholeheartedly. What I'm trying to tell you is a lot of us on this planet have been chasing after the wrong source of creation, has actually been chasing after slave masters. And they have successfully en enslaved mankind for a very, very long time. You got to read this book. The Gods of Eden by William Bramley. The Gods of Eden by William Bramley is based on Sumerian tablets. That's why I like this book. It's not based on opinion. It's not based on conjecture. It's based on the tablets. And we find that the mental and financial enslavement go all the way back thousands of years. In this book, we, he, he actually reveals the origin of inflation. The origin of inflation is even in here. You find that they set up this political structure for us with this bicameral Congress, which is still operating today. And they themselves had a whole different system that they went on, that they, that they uh, ruled under, this number system that they had. They had a, a system of numbers. And you ruled by your order of your hierarchy and the totem pole was based on your number. But they gave us this polytrick system. I call it polytrix, right? That's what they gave us, the polytrick system to keep us embroiled in foolishness. And then what they did was they installed a monetary system that was set up from the beginning to, 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 um, to give us inflation so that we can stay financially enslaved. So we have to continue to work hard, work hard, work hard until we die. And so how it was set up initially, you'll find out if you read this book, The Gods of Eden by William Bramley. Uh, let's say you had a farm and you had goats, right? And I had an apple orchard. And now I want some goats because I want to have, I don't know, I want to have some meat for my family. And you want apples because you want apples so you, your wife can make apple pie or whatever. I bring you a satchel of apples, right? Maybe two satchels for one goat. Now, when I get there, there's no goats. There's a celebration coming. It's one of these, you know, Passovers or something, and all the goats are gone. I got there too late. Now, what will happen is the and we know this because we found all the tablets that actually have the IOU. So what I'm telling you is fact. All right. So what happens is um, uh, we get the you, you drop off your two satchels of, um, of apples and the guy gives you a stone tablet, which we have found and we have records of that says, OK, I owe you a goat. So you walk away with this money, this 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 dollar or whatever you want to call it, fake stone money that says, you know, you can come back and get your goat later. You come back about, I don't know, three, four weeks, a month later, whatever it is. You, I need I really need to get this goat. You come back now because it's just a shortage and back order of goats. Guess what? That one IOU chip for that goat is not enough to get a whole goat. You can only get half of a goat. You can only get half of a goat inflation right there this is the system they put us on they set this monetary system up for us they knew exactly what it was going to do it was going to put us in a situation where we'd always be in debt and we'd work and work and work to try to cut to pay off this debt which means that we were working for them the whole time you see we're the prisoners and we're the prison guards it's a great system they got us fooled from the from front to back this is what they did to us and so now you go damn i can only get a half a goat I don't have enough for a whole goat now because inflation happened. 
supply and demand, right? This is the system that they set up, and they found over 1 million of these IOUs laying around. And so we've got these IOUs in museums and so forth and in, in, in archaeological collections. So it's well known. It's not even hidden. But this was the very, very beginning. Okay, very, very beginning. Um, let me answer this one question right quick here, too, before I start to wrap this up. Somebody says, why do some people say the Anunnaki are reptilian? Now, that's a good question. Anunnaki is not one race of people, by the way. Anunnaki means those that came from heaven to earth. So the Anunnaki could be any race of any person, any being from anywhere in the entire universe. It's not just one group of people. It's multitudes of people, right? So uh, within the Anunnaki, you have some beings that look reptilian. You had the the uh, Ubaid, Ubaid people. It's pronounced Ubaid. U-B-A-I-D, right? You had the Ubaid people. And the Ubaid people, they look reptilian. There's statuettes of them. I actually have a couple of statuettes in my cabinet here of these Ubaid people. They actually, um, you know, there's, 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 they found hundreds of them. Some of them look like they're more royalty and have a higher status. And some of them were just wearing loincloths, which means they were working status. There's Ubaid reptilian people breastfeeding babies and everything else. They lived here. They were here before the famous Anunnaki arrived here, the ones that we talk about the most that actually look more like humans. They were here before they even arrived. And the culture was out there again in Mesopotamia and remnants of their civilization is still there out in those deserts. OK, there's evidence of some type of war because some of the structures that, that they were living in turned to glass, which means we're talking about 3000 degrees temperature, which means we're talking about vitrification. When you heat up sand to 3,000 plus degrees, it becomes vitrified, which means it turns to glass. The only way to make a, a, a heat that hot is through some type of a blast. And right now, the only way we can do it is with a nuclear blast. So there was some type of war back then that eradicated these people at that particular time. Uh, let's see here. I see somebody quoting from the Emerald Tablets. Deep in Earth's heart lies a halls of Amenti. Beneath the islands of the sunken Atlantis, halls of the dead and halls of the living, bathed in the fire of the infinite all. That's from the halls of, that's from the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. Powerful stuff. Okay. Moon Goddess, selling, selling debt, a great system. That's right, Moon Goddess. They really figured this thing out. Install a religious system. Install a worship gene. Get people to bring you all their food by bringing all your offerings to them so they can have supplies of food. You'll find when we go to these temples that they even had hidden chambers in the temples where the pyramid priest or the temple priest would go hide. And then they would talk through these little mouthpieces that would create an echo inside the temple. And the people would think they're talking to God. They were just talking to a priest that were hiding behind the walls, talking through these little channels that would magnify their voices. There was no God there. It was just people. Okay. They would take all that food and all those donations and put them in the storehouse and they would have food and, and, and stuff for, for months. That's what they did. All right. The Conscious Conqueror says, where have the Anunnaki gone? Well, there's a twofold answer to that question. One is at the end of the last pyramid war that was started by Amun-Ra, also known as Marduk. And where can you find Marduk? You can find him right in here. Where else can you find Marduk? You can find him right in here. You can find him right in here. <laughs> you can find him in the Torah. You can find him, which is upstairs. You can find him in the Jewish American Library. He's everywhere. Amen Ra is when you say amen, you're, you're giving thanks to him. He's the one that ordered it. He ordered that everyone give him thanks at the end of every prayer. And so when you say thank you, you're saying thanks to one of the most evil people of all time who created two wars, and the wars were over the two things. One was because he didn't want people worshiping other gods. He said, I'm a jealous God, and there'll be no other God but me. That made it into the Bible, right? That's a, that's a famous biblical text, but that was said thousands of years prior by Marduk. And then the, uh, the other reason he started a war was because he wanted to take over kingship of the world ahead of his processionary period. These Anunnaki pantheon, they ruled on based on procession of the equinoxes. And so he is the procession of Pisces, which we're still in Pisces right now. It's about to end. We're going into the age of Aquarius. 
And a lot of people don't know that that fish that you see on the back of people's cars, they think there's for Jesus. It actually represents Pisces and it represents Marduk, Amun, Ra. They don't realize that. But anyway, he started a war because he wanted to take over early ahead of his processional period. And that war is one of the reasons why the sands of Egypt, the sand and the buildings in Mohenjo-Daro and in, in the Indus Valley are all, all now turned to glass. It was a battle using some type of weapon. And I talk about this in my book, The Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. I've talked about it before in several lectures. They used the Brahma weapon, the, the Brahmahada weapon. These weapons were real weapons that they used that can heat the, the sand to 3,000 plus degrees, turning it to sand, turning buildings to sand, e turning people to, to piles of dust. We have an account in the Bible of that happening, right? Where the woman turned and turned it turned around and turned into a pillar of salt. Is it really salt? It's really ash. And what it is, it's representing the, that weapon that came down on that city. That was a dropped weapon. Make no mistake about it. And it was it was it was planned to be dropped, and it was known ahead of time the coordinates and even the time that it was going to drop. And these are these are talked about in these other texts, like the Mahabharata. They openly talk about these weapons. There's a weapon in here that can destroy a man on three worlds. They have weapons that can destroy planets in these texts. Do you think these people were sitting around ten thousand years ago? Let me write a, a fictional story about a weapon the size of a planet that can destroy planets. No, didn't happen like that. These people only wrote down things that were important. They didn't have time to be writing play play. Uh, just surviving on a daily basis was hard enough. A lot of times they wrote down important, important things. And so the Anunnaki, to answer the question, some left from the war. And the second part is some didn't leave. Some are still here. Uh, and their bloodlines most likely are still here. Like, for example, I believe that Yeshua is a demigod, part human, part Anunnaki. Uh, and the reason why is because when you find out, when you read the Apocrypha text, you find out that his grandmother, Mary's mother, was also a virgin birth. How do you get a virgin birth right now in today's age? You get a virgin birth by in vitro fertilization. And I believe that um, either Enki or maybe even um, Enlil, one of those two, uh, are the father, and I think it's in vitro fertilization. And I believe that um, even the Merovingian bloodline still exists today, which would be the bloodline of Jesus, because they found the book of Jesus's wife, which is at the seminary at Harvard in Boston. I had it in my hands uh, in 2018. And so he got he never got crucified. That story is a fabrication of Rome. Never happened. If you read the Sinai Bible, which predates the King James Bible, Jesus never got crucified. Matter of fact, he most likely got married, had kids, and that bloodline is still on the planet today. Planet blood, uh, the bloodline of, 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 of Enlil, a bloodline of Enki, these people, they're still walking on the planet till this very day. When you trace back, when you go to, to the Sumerian kings list uh, and you analyze the names on that list and you then fast forward in time to where you see it after the flood, where kingship was handed over to man and they were mating with a human to create a demigod known as a pharaoh that would be the liaison between humans and the gods. And then the pharaoh is bloodline. Then the pharaohs would then, uh, you know, give birth and that bloodline would maintain until the, the, uh, the Egyptian dynasties were overthrown for the seventh time and they started migrating across Arabia up into Europe. Where along the way, they're mating, having babies and everything else. They turn from their original race into a more of a Caucasian race by the time they get to Europe. But they're still keeping all the traditions. This is why when you go to England, you go to the palace, right, where the queen is, you're going to see all Egyptian motif there. And their own words, they said, we have the right to rule over mankind. They believe it's because of their bloodline. It traces all the way back to the Sumerian kings, uh, you know, faintly by now, obviously, but. Their concept and the idea is there that they that they're in some way uh, related to these people. And so they believe that they have the right to rule, rule over the planet uh, in the way that they do. All right. So and, and the answer is that they're gone. But through bloodlines, a lot of them are still here. Uh, let's see here. I just answered that one. Oops, let's see here. There's two types of blood types, RH and RH 
an RH negative and RH positive. Wonder what that means. Well, um, well, Grace, I have R negative and sort of my mom. It's kind of a rare blood type. And uh, my mom almost died having my brother. She started hemorrhaging and they couldn't get it because only 15% of the world have that blood type. So it's pretty interesting. There's still a lot of research being done on it. Um, it's a it's a rare blood type. There's a blood plasma bank here in my city that I go to every three months and donate my own blood in case something happens to me. I can get blood to you know for transfusion. Um, if I'm out of the country or I'm gone somewhere, I'm in trouble. You know, uh, a lot of the scientists uh, they say the Rh is a rare blood type and. They don't, they call it alien blood, but I don't know if they're calling alien because aliens, but they're just saying that it's not something in the normal blood pool, but it's pretty interesting. It does have some benefits, but it also has downfalls, obviously. Um, you know, one of the benefits of this blood type and you can't, AIDS virus doesn't bind to the cell. So it's very difficult to get a found that, you know, through studies that people with that blood type, they just don't get AIDS, things like that. But, you know, like I said, it has this positive, but it also has it's negatives as well, you know? Um, so it definitely is uh, interesting. It could be a throwback from from these Anunnaki people. Let's see here. Let's see, let's see. How do you change religious genes in others? Great question, Ashley. The only way to do it is they have to do it themselves. And it takes them, first of all, realizing that the information that they were born into and, and um, bred into to believe is faltered. It's not accurate. And once once they can come to the realization that the information that they've been believing in their entire lives is actually not 100% true, it's like when you're a drug addict or an alcoholic. The only way to overcome it is you have to admit that you have a problem. So until these people actually fully face the fact that what they've been born into is not actually real uh or it has a lot of holes in it let's say and start doing research then and only then will they begin to rewrite their dna so you know it, dna can be rewritten it can be changed it can be altered we know this through um through simple experiments if you speak positive affirmations out loud to where you can actually hear your voice three times a day for 21 days your DNA will be rewritten because of that. We know this in science fact, not, not fiction. The same thing for these people. When they come to the realization that they need to dig a little bit deeper and then they start buying books and then on their own volition, start doing the research and start doing their own study. There's one thing that's accurate in this Bible. It says study to show thyself approved. And I agree with that 1000%. Study to show thyself approved. When they begin to do the studying and all the research and they start to read and analyze all this text, right? And they go, oh man, this is not what I thought it was. And the realization hits them. There's a whole lot more that, that they can learn. And they need to understand that what they were taught is not 100% accurate. There's more. It's even more grander than what this story is. What this story is, is actually nothing. There's even a bigger story than this. And so instead of being intimidated by the fact that this book is not accurate and there's a lot of misinformation in it, be more excited that it's even more grand than what they even thought. And there's a lot more to learn. There's a lot more to understand. The universe is incredible. Our connection to the stars and other beings is incredible. There's a whole nother reality going on behind this reality. And there's a whole nother, uh, path to ascension that you didn't even know existed and that's when they'll begin to rewrite their their that worship gene and change it and and go start to look within instead of looking outside oh yeah elvis says dna slicing for decades oh yeah that's for real man they've been slicing that dna up for a long long time uh it's something that they uh They'll never stop doing that. I'll tell you what, the one thing they have figured out, they figured out how to make mice live three times their normal lifespan by stopping the shrinking of the, uh, the telomeres. Now, what's interesting is if they can do it in mice, they can already do it in people. It's just a matter of can you afford to, can you afford to pay the fee? 
when it becomes more mainstream, this telomere, uh, right now it's just telomere research, but when it becomes an actual telomere therapy, where it's an actual therapy that can actually extend your lifespan to, to make you live 300 years old, when it gets to that point, if we as people on this planet don't take back control of this planet and our reality, what's going to happen is these elite people, they're going to monetize telomere uh, treatments. They're going to monetize it by selling us time. I'm telling you, remember I told you this, if we don't take back control of this planet, who we are, uh, you know, we need to change this whole economic system. We need to change this whole political system. If we don't take back control of this planet from the elites, what's going to happen is when this telomere uh, uh, research turns into actual telomere treatment and it's actually really working well, man, you don't want to be sold time because that's what it's going to come down to. I'm just telling you, that's what it's going to come down to. How do we take back our sovereignty? Green Eye says, what's your take on the book of Revelation? Uh, that's a great question. The book of Revelation, is, re, the book of Revelation is, uh, re, Revelations is a very interesting book. Um, you know, it's this end time preaching that has allowed a lot of preachers to make a lot of money and has allowed them to build these mega churches and everything else and lure a lot of people in. And it's always the end times. But I tell you, there is no end time right now. It's not we're not even close to an end time right now. And the reason why I say that is there has been far more darker periods and eras in time on this planet than we are in right now. As dark and as bad as it looks right now, there's been times that are far worse than this. We're actually living in a great time, to be honest with you. Now, does it mean that everybody's having a good old time around the planet? No. I'm talking about overall. As a percentage base, uh, if you go back, you know, we're talking about the, the Inquisitions. We're talking about the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague, all these things that almost wiped out humanity. Just just a lot of eras gone back. The, uh, the American Holocaust, you probably don't even know about that one, right? 111 million indigenous natives murdered and slaughtered in the Americas. Over the course of, I think it was 70 years, 111 million, almost killed to extinction, these people. All right. So we're not even close to the end times. The end times would have happened all the way back then when 80 million were getting killed, when 111 million were getting killed, when the bubonic plague was wiping out the planet, when the black plague was wiping out the planet. So we're talking about a writing that is um, trying to lash out at the people of that era and also uh trying to convince people to join a cause really and that there will be this and to give people this solace and peace that you know the trauma and the drama and the and the issues that they're going through right now will be rewarded greatly you know but in true reality it still was relying on external aid external sources external help and ex external assistance which just is not the case it was written for a time in that era but it has no application to us whatsoever right now. One thing that's interesting in that book, if you read the book of Revelation, you find out that it's talking about reincarnation and the fact that you come back as an actual person with a name, with a new name and everything else and a new body. It doesn't say you're going to be this etherical being of light floating in dimensions. It doesn't say you're going to be in higher dimensions floating around and without a body. No, it says you're going to come back with a new body and a new name. It almost kind of really talks about having a breakaway civilization on another planet. You know, you go take it to a new planet and you put inside this new this new city being built, right? This new Jerusalem and all this kind of stuff. So it's pretty interesting, interesting, far out stuff. But uh, I don't think there's any end times coming anytime soon. I don't think we're even close to an end time, in my personal opinion. Even the Cold War was fake. People thought it was going to be the end times with the with the Cold War against America and Russia. Listen to me. Russia and America, no matter what you see on the news, are the best of friends. They're the best of buddies. Always have been and always will be. The Cold War was a money-making, multi-trillion dollar opportunity, and they took it. And they, and, they, and they pimped a lot of people around the planet and, and, and put a lot of fear on a lot of people and traumatized them. 
for this war dollars, which funded a lot of private corporations, which they sat on the boards of these poly tricksters, and they all made money and they be and they retired as rich fat men. That's what the Cold War was about. While the whole Cold War was going on, America and Russia would have a good old were having a good old time uh, on science and science experiments and space experiments and all this other kind of stuff. America and Russia are the best of friends. Always have been, and always will be. The only people that don't know this are the working class people that were tricked into thinking that they're our enemy. The people on the higher levels is just a charade, okay? Just a big charade. All right. Let's see here. I'm going to ask one more, then I got to get out of here. It's getting late. I got to get some food in my belly. Let's see what we got. <clears throat> one more question here. Huh, somebody said comrades. Yep, there are comrades. For my Russian people, Snovengodum. Kaktila. Speak a little Russian for you. They were the allies, you're right. I like this by Lynn Gaffney. Gaffney. Fear is a low vibration emotion. And so what the Anunnaki have done by creating this religious system, by making us worship them, by installing a worship gene and making us look externally for help and assistance, they have actually um, activated the fear. And by activating fear, what you see, one thing they use to get people to, to do things. Right now, if you turn on the news, it's fear, 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 fear. And then they make you do whatever they want. They say, you got to go do this and you go do it because you're afraid. And so this is a that's not a new thing. It's, been, it's an ancient thing. And so they use fear. And fear is a frequency that can, that can be used to manipulate you. And they knew this. So let's get them begging and praying to us and hoping and wishing to us so that we can become energy vampires and eat all their energy, drain them emotionally, drain them financially, drain them spiritually. Now we control them. We can mold them. We can manipulate them into doing whatever we want. That's why fear is dangerous. It's a choice, but most people don't know that, right? All right. Mook the Messiah, Blue Avians, can you explain anything, please? Blue avians don't exist. It's fake. There's a book in here. I have a book. That whole blue avian story was made up from a book. The person, I'm not going to name any names. So Y'all know the name of that person. There's a book. I have it here in the house. So we find that book. It's an old, little known book. Let me see if I can find the name of this book right quick while I catch on. That story was copied out of this book written by a woman and turned into a whole TV show and everything else. And nothing but a whole bunch of fake stuff. Uh... And uh, they took the story and turned it into their story and made it into this whole big thing and tricked uh, and tricked millions of people and had millions of people watching this stuff every single week until it finally got canceled when the people that were producing it realized it was fake, fake news. Uh, let me see. Uh, let's see if I can find the name of this book right quick. The book is called Alien Contact and the Messages They Bring. Alien contact, the messages they bring. It's a book that was it's a uh, that was put into um, print in February fourteenth, two thousand six, by Bonnie Meyer. And uh, the story in this book is the Blue Avian story that somebody, a guy, took and copied the whole story and turned it into his old alien abduction story and uh, what he was doing with them and everything else. The whole thing was stolen from this book, Alien Contact, The Messages They Bring, February 14, 2006. A little, a little known book that hardly anybody knows. The book only has 10 ratings on Amazon. That's how little anybody knows of this book. But I got all the books <laughs> and I read everything. But that story was copied almost word for word out of that book. It's a fake story made up to make a whole bunch of money off of um, somebody else's book, really. Okay. And the last thing I'll say. Uh, fear of false evidence or fake evidence appearing real. That's right, Silver Fox. That's exactly what it is. Um, without a doubt, that's what fear is. I appreciate every single one of you guys. Thank you for spending time with me on here tonight. Uh, I wish I could stay on a little bit longer, but it is way past 
one hour and I got some other things to work on and do. Uh, all right. But hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for sticking around. I'll do another one next week, depending on my studio time. I'm booked into a studio. We'll see what day it is here uh, to record a TV show. Um, so on the 13th, depending on what time I get out of this TV show on the 13th, um, I should be able to go on live. If I found out that I can't go live on the 13th, be- well, no way before then, I'll have a podcast uploaded to the platform and ready for you guys to watch. But if I can go live, I'll go live on the 13th again. All right. Thank you for watching this video. Please click the like button. Please click the bell so you can get notifications. And also, please share this video. And I'll be back on again next week. All right. Peace.